Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes right now, please leave a five-star review. I got shirts for sale, guys. This is very exciting. The holiday season is upon us. Go to Tee Public and get your loved one or yourself one of these amazing Chrissy Mayer t-shirts. Look at this. Have yourself a Mayer Chrissy Miss. This comes, you get one in red, green, blue, normal colors. It doesn't stop there, guys. I have this one too, which is awesome. If It's like a little bit of a Patriot vibe. Make America great again. This is great. That might be my body. It might not be. That's up for you to decide. Also, I'm doing a hot sauce collab with Silk City Hot Sauce. Here it is. Boom. It's called Nightmare. And it's really delicious. I'm going to bring up the website so I can read the description. It's so good. It is. And they're only 10 bucks. Plus, if you use promo code CMP, you get a few bucks off. Uh, it's smooth and sweet with a burst of fire. Jalapenos, pear, sweet apple cider, and super hot habanero. This is the verde sauce that'll awaken your soul. And it's me eating someone innards. Nightmare. Good stuff. Check it out. Go to Levinsky's Top Shelf. Dot com. That's L-E-V-I-N-S-K-Y-S topshelf.com. Get yourself some Chrissy Mayer hot sauce. Get yourself a Chrissy Mayer shirt. Also, I'm doing stand-up. I got a bunch of dates coming up uh, before my album recording on January 6th at Governor's in Levittown. Uh, December 11th, I will be... Wow, that's this Saturday. I will be at Tiff's Ale House with the comedians of The Compound, Aaron Berg, Gino Bisconti, Don Jameson, all the guys you love from Compound Media will all be there doing super funny stand-up. Then I'm headlining uh, in Hartford, the Hartford Funny Bone, December 12th. Then December 13th, I'm heading to Arkansas to headline the uh, Looney Bin there in Little Rock. And then heading back to Texas, December 15th and 16th, going to do a bunch of appearances at The Blaze. Then I'm doing uh, a show... 15th and 16th with Aaron Berg and Anthony Cumia will be at Hyenas in Dallas. For tickets, go to my website, chrissymayer.com, or you can go to any of the club sites and buy your tickets that way. Would love to see you guys at these shows. They're going to be a lot of fun. And, of course, my album recording on January 6th at Governor's in Levittown, ah, Long Island. It'll be fun to go back. I'm very excited. You know what else I'm really excited for? This guest. Uh, he is not just a libertarian, but a Jeffersonian libertarian. And he's going to tell me what that means. He's also a spokesman for the Young Americans for Liberty. He's a former Maine senator, which is amazing because he's so young. He's also the host of Free America Now. Welcome to the show, Eric Brakey. Hey, Chrissy. Thank you so much for having me. Do you Are you sick of people saying, like, don't tell my heart? My Eric Brakey heart. I've been hearing it since I was five years old. (laughs) At a certain point, you learn to just like you can be annoyed by it or you can just learn to live with it and embrace it. I actually used um, I used that in one of my first campaign commercials. I just decided just embrace it. If it if it helps people uh, remember your name when they got to check the box at the ballot booth. then I guess I guess it's a good thing. Did it work? It did. I won. Oh, okay. So it did work. You know, some people get (laughs) annoyed with. You know, you, you got to get creative, though, when you're running for office. I'm oh, so yeah. I'm curious as to you're so young. You're only 33. What made you want to run for office so young? Yeah, I was actually uh, I got elected to the state Senate when I was 26. I was the youngest state what? senator in the country. Did you get uh, a, a prize for that or a pin? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no trophy for that. Um, but no, I was just a young guy. Um, I was. You know, got involved in the Ron Paul campaign for president when he was running back in 2012, uh, became the state director for his campaign in Maine. And it was one of the few states that Ron Paul won that year. There was a big, big fight about it. <laughs> That's a whole long story. But uh, but yeah, no, after the, there Ron, a fight about it. Well, um, Mitt Romney and his campaign didn't like that. The state just right there next to Massachusetts, Mitt Romney's home state, went to Ron Paul and. Uh, I was a, a bunch of us were elected as delegates to the national convention in Tampa, the, uh, in 2012. And, uh, they kicked us out. 
I got kicked out. They, I was, you know, 23 years old, show up wow. at the national convention, you know, ready to be a Republican delegate, vote for my, my guy, Ron Paul, congressman from Texas. And the, uh, the old guard establishment said, no, we're going to take that away from you and take it away from a bunch of these folks that you guys elected. And we're going to give it to some Mitt Romney supporters so that Ron Paul couldn't get us sp- to, uh, uh, give a speech, uh, there That's at the horrible. convention. That's so unfair. What did you, did you have any recourse after that? No, well, my recourse was I ran for a state senate. Yeah, <laughs> and I I'm kept pissed now. Fight. I, I, you know, I, I felt like it was an Obi Wan Kenobi moment. You strike me down now, I'll rise more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And I kind of, you know, just try to keep running with it. So, yeah, you. Um, okay, so I want to bring up an interesting tweet that you re- responded to one of Dave Smith's tweets recently, and I think this is a really great tweet because I'm just going to read it. Uh, ultimately. The Liberty GOP strategy rests on this. Don't mindlessly vote GOP. Be a swing voter. That's who gets catered to. Withhold your votes from authoritarian Republicans, but also let them know that your vote can be won with a Rand Paul or Thomas Massey Republican. And when we talk about sort of the, I guess, the merging or the working together of Republicans and Libertarians, I feel like there's a lot of, it seems like a lot of conflict over this, almost like. I don't know. Do you feel like libertarians can some be like sometimes be like too proud or uh, why should we have to come yeah. to them? Um, can you what do you think the reason for this is? You know, seriously, now, Dave Smith and I have uh, debated on this issue in the past and much, much love and respect to Dave Smith. I, I admire him quite a bit and I think he's a great messenger uh, for, for, you know, the cause that I believe in. Um, but I ultimately I think that we we make a mistake when we, inv- you know, um, imbue these political parties with all this kind of ideological value that's intrinsic to them. It's not intrinsic to them. The political parties are just vehicles and we need to treat them like vehicles. You need to use the vehicle that's going to be most effective at getting you where you want to go. And if it doesn't serve that purpose, then leave it behind, find a different vehicle. What should matter is our principles, what we believe in. What what should matter is trying to promote the cause of liberty. So I, you know, I, I call myself a liberty Republican. I consider the liberty movement to be what I'm you know, most passionate for, what I'm really fighting for. And I've just found that the Republican Party has been an effective vehicle for me to promote that. The Republican Party was, you know, because of the Republican Party, Ron Paul was able to get on the debate stage and spread the message to millions of people. Because I ran as a Republican and not as a big L libertarian, I was able to win election to the state Senate, serve two terms pass constitutional carry, expand medical cannabis freedom in our state, uh, get a whole host of reforms done. Um, And I even went on to be the Republican nominee for United States Senate. Uh, So this was, you know, um, and if I'd run as an LP candidate, and I have many friends who are in the LP, and I say more power to them. If you think you got a better strategy than me, then prove it. You know, the proof will be in the pudding. Maybe I'm wrong about this. But, uh, but But the way that the system is built is um, if you aren't in one of the two major parties, you're gonna get you're just gonna get shafted. Uh, it's it's a system that's designed to make it very difficult for third party candidates and independent candidates to have a shot in a general election. So if you actually want to get elected, you should pick one of the two major parties and you should run with that. So uh, that's what I say there. Do you? <laughs> do you get the feeling like I have to, you have to hide that you're a libertarian at first or like, Oh, I'm just running as Republican. And then you try to through your policies or through your beliefs. I don't know. Do people get scared off by the word libertarian? Uh, you know, sometimes I think some people don't always understand it. So, you know, I like it's ultimately the end of the day, it's a word. And I think it's the ideas that matter. You know, I could brand myself a libertarian. I could brand myself a constitutional conservative. I could brand myself a uh, classical liberal, all of these mean the same thing, but depending on what your audience is, they might interpret it different ways. So, you know, use whatever label makes the most sense for communicating what you're, you, the message you're trying to get across to people. But as far as like when I was running as a Republican, I mean, people pretty much knew where I was. <laughs> I, I kind of, you know, after kind of the insurrection we led in the GOP in, in the state in 2012, uh, the establishment knew what they were getting with me. They they certainly actually didn't want me in the state Senate. But uh, we um, anyway, we overcame that. I, I defeated a 36 year Democrat incumbent. And um, wow. yeah, yeah, it sounds crusty. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the Republicans at the end of the day, they at least when I say the Republicans, the Republican establishment at the end of the day was 
just happy there was someone with an R there, even if I was a thorn in their side on uh, many, uh, many other things. But I find that, you know, like in the Republican Party, there's a lot in the liberty message that resonates with, you know, base Republican voters. And so emphasize those parts of the message. I emphasize, you know, gun rights and welfare reform and health care freedom. And um, and I got a lot of these things done better than a lot of the Republicans who'd been talking a good game and not doing anything for a long time. And so then when I went out on a limb and also advocated for and got things done on, you know, medical cannabis and uh, advocating for criminal justice reform, I, you know, I think there were some people who maybe said, well, all right, I disagree with him on marijuana, but... But he's the one who got us back our gun rights, so we'll give him a we'll give him a pass there. So that's how I Bravo. approach it. Bravo, good for you. That's it's uh, it's rare that you. I don't know. I feel like you're able to get a lot done in a short amount of time. So that's commendable. Your thoughts on these vax mandates? It seems like we've had a, a bit of a win recently. It seems like uh, I think it just came out that if you're a, a, a federal, well, they were Biden was trying to push like the having federal employees or or federal um contractors have to get it but i think that was recently struck down in the courts if i'm not mistaken um are you feeling like the slow fight over the mandates is is being won or do you feel like it's just they're going to stretch it out they're going to you know push more variants yeah i i mean i think that the the uh, you know ultimately compliance with these policies has rested on fear and and people uh, being afraid of the virus being afraid of the consequences from the government i think that people are less and less afraid and it's really kind of wearing itself out um it just doesn't make any sense i mean uh, it's 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 interesting to me you know the way the technology of these we call them vaccines but they're more like gene therapies they're very different than what we traditionally think of as vaccines there's no dead or live virus in it you know it's just you know, it's, it's a gene therapy. You know, there've been so many, there've been studies that have come out and, sh and shown that uh, the vaccines may have a very, you know, positive effect on, on, you know, reducing an individual's risk of being hospitalized or, or, or dying of COVID. And that's a really great thing. But those same studies have come out and shown that it, it, it they're negligible when it comes to preventing uh, transmission uh, and infection. You know, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya at Stanford University is the epidemiologist over there, one of the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. He's been very clear. Like vaccination, he th sees it as a good thing. It's something that people should, especially people in vulnerable categories, should really look at for themselves. But he's been very clear. This is a matter of private personal health. This is not a matter of public health. This does not contribute to herd immunity. This does not, by getting vaccinated, you're protecting yourself, perhaps, but you're not protecting others. And that's runs counter to everything the establishment's trying to tell us as they justify mandating these vaccines. Yeah, yet the marketing around these injections is all about the greater good. You, you do it for others. Um, they're really trying to guilt and shame and use social pressure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's um, and it's not, you know, for all the talk of follow the science. I mean, if you actually are following the studies and what's coming out on you know, transmission and infection rates among the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated, the science says that uh, it really doesn't make a difference in that regard. In fact, the best thing is natural immunity, which actually does reduce tr uh, infection and transmission. And yet those are a lot of the folks who are getting fired from their jobs. I know a guy up in Aroostook County, Maine, who's been working in a, a nursing home for 15 years he got COVID, he recovered from it, he's got natural immunity. Well, everyone else in, in the workplace has been getting COVID, including the vaccinated. He, he hasn't gotten it again. Wow. Epidemiologists have recommended, that's exactly the kind of person you want dealing with the most vulnerable. Those who've had COVID, recovered from it, have the, have the natural immunity. And yet he's, he's, he's getting fired from his job. And so are many healthcare workers across it's the country. It's crazy, especially him. He's worked in a nursing home. He's seen so many old people having sex, you know, these nursing homes, <laughs> that's, that's rampant. They're horny. They're old. They feel like they've got nothing to lose. This poor guy, he's got a natural immunity and he's losing his job. It's crazy. <laughs> I too am a COVID survivor. Uh, I'm wondering if I should sell my, um, my natural immunity, like in little, little bottles, like how 
girls on OnlyFans sell bath water. I don't know. I'll look into it. I don't know if I can do that. Maybe if I need some extra dollars. All right. I've creeped Eric out. Back <laughs> to the topic. Um, what is the difference between little L um, libertarians and big L libertarians? Yeah. So a little L libertarian is just someone who believes the ideas and a big L libertarian is, well, that's a political party. So you could theoretically be a little L libertarian and be registered Republican, registered Democrat. Though I don't know why you'd be a registered Democrat these days. Maybe there's, I don't know, but you could be a, you know, you could be in any political party or you could be someone who doesn't vote at all and doesn't ga engage in the political process. I know plenty of small L libertarians who, who don't. Um, so, you know, it really is the idea that the philosophy, the ideas are bigger than any one political party. And the political parties at the end of the day, should we should just view them as the vehicles that we use to try to advance the strategy that we believe in. I mean, that would be great. Yeah. But a lot of people are so group minded, you know, all about what team are we on? Did my guy win? Did my guy lose? Yeah. We're very tribal by nature as humans. All right, but that's interesting about the little L and the big L. So that means in college, I was a little L lesbian. Good, good to clear it up. <laughs> you never joined the big L lesbian political party. I, I, don't, know, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's formed that one. <laughs> no, uh, that'd be fun though. Um, okay, there's a very interesting story that came up. Um, this is, has to do with civil asset forfeiture. Um, I saw you tweeting about it today. So apparently there was a, a woman who had over a hundred thousand dollars seized from her uh, at an airport. And they didn't say in this article, whether it was a domestic or an international flight. Like I, you know, we know that there's rules about having over $10,000 worth of cash. Um, but this woman had over a hundred thousand dollars on her. Uh, this was at Dallas. Okay. Dallas love field airport. Yeah. And of course they, you know, they promote this news like, oh, good for, I mean, I love dogs. I'm all for dogs doing their jobs. But uh, they were like, on December 2nd, the canine named Ballantyne alerted an individual checked suitcase. It turned out that the bag belonged to a 25-year-old woman from Chicago, was on layover at the airport, contained blankets and two large bubble envelopes filled with 106 and $829 in cash. The woman who owned the bag was not arrested, but the money was seized, and the police say it will be subject to the civil asset forfeiture process. K9 Ballantine is part of the Dallas Love Field uh, interdiction squad, which is a unit, blah, 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 blah. Why is this so? I mean, this makes me upset because this woman is not guilty of any kind of a crime, right. yet the right. fact that she's just carrying this much cash on her almost in a way makes her seem criminal. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as so w they haven't given us any more details than that. So I don't know. May maybe this person was a big drug smuggler and that's why they've got a hundred thousand dollars. I don't know. And even, you know, but just going on what we know, um, civil asset forfeiture, you're not required to charge anyone with a crime. You're basically, the government's just coming in and saying, we think you might be up to something. So we're just going to take all, we're just going to take your property and we don't have to prove anything in court. So it's basically, it's, it's, it's legalized theft by the government. Many states have moved to abolish this practice. So in my state of Maine, shout out to state representative, Billy Bob Falkingham up there who got it passed to outlaw civil asset forfeiture in the state of Maine. And basically just have a standard that if you're going to take someone's property because you think that they're, you know, involved in some kind of crime, then you should charge them with a crime and prove it in court mm -hmm. and only take their property once you've actually convicted them of doing something wrong. But what has happened, we've seen so much abuse of civil asset forfeiture laws across the country because there is no standard of proof. There's nothing that they have to prove. It's you, you, you have seen police departments in the country that will, uh, you've got documented, they'll, they'll seize people's money and they're not even necessarily always using it for, you know, the good noble purposes. They'll use it for, as like a slush fund to buy a margarita machine for the local police station. You have cases where a, a, a person's house is seized because their 26 year old kid, unbeknownst to them, was selling a little bit of marijuana out the back door. And so their whole house is seized and they've got very little recourse. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's a terrible, terrible law. And, um, it's just as kind of crazy to me that the government thinks that this is something to brag about. Look at the dog with the hundred thousand dollars. It seems to like imply that it's a crime to transport large amounts of money. 
I don't know why this person is transporting large amounts of money. Maybe they don't trust the banks. Maybe they're moving to a new place. And yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't know, but that's their property. It's their money. They should be able to transport it and hold it however they want. Yeah. And, and she could have been fleeing somebody in your thread mentioned. Oh, she could have been fleeing like a domestic abuse situation. And then there was this, you know, chat with another woman and they're like, yeah, this is exactly what, uh, what she or someone she knew had to do. She had to empty her whole bank account and then flee uh, like an abusive husband or boyfriend or something. You just take as, take everything out. That way you're not traced and you can start a new life. And if that's what this woman was doing, well, now she's doubly screwed because all of her money has been taken and she's just in a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. And there've been so many cases like that across the country. What's crazy is that many states will outlaw this practice and then what will happen is, but that's, but it's outlawed for their state police departments and their local police departments. But what they'll do is that the federal law still allows it. And so the local agencies will outsource it to the feds. The feds will come in and do the civil asset forfeiture and then do like a revenue sharing back with the state. So completely circumventing the laws put in place by the people of those states to try to pr uh, protect against this kind of, you know, government theft. Uh, but the federal government just, you know, they, they love our money. They'll take it any way they can. They do love our money. And I hope that they're enjoying the hot tub that they are bundling all this cash into. I just imagine a hot tub fund. That's what I would do. Do you feel like generally state laws are are stronger or or you have more faith in them than than federal laws? I think that the more local the government is, the more accountable it is to the people, the easier it is to, you know, if there's a bad policy, you know, you as a regular person can get involved and get the policy changed when it's, so I always think like, think of like a school board policy. <laughs> I guess a lot of parents are up in arms about school board policies these days, but you can show up to your local school board meeting. You can grab a bunch of parents and like have a couple angry parents tell the school board they got to change this or you're going to vote them out of office. And you know what, when you're kind of, you know, one of a couple thousand voters, you actually have a considerable amount of power there. But now you take that and you put that on a state level. And now you're talking about, well, maybe we got to raise millions of dollars to get this policy changed. And heaven forbid, it's like coming from the Federal Department of Education. It's coming from the, the national level. I mean, how does the regular average person who's impacted by this decision have a real say in this? Maybe you get to vote on your one representative to the U.S. House, you get your, your two U.S. senators. But in the grand scheme of things, you have very little power in this situation. The more we concentrate power in this, you know, centralized, you know, it's these centralized institutions in Washington, D.C., the more it becomes kind of a one stop shop for special interests to kind of hijack a policy making and for the regular people, the regular citizens of this country to really be kind of shut out of the policy making process. So, I, I, yeah, I think decisions need to be made as close to home as possible whenever, whenever we can. And it's almost like what we're seeing with this vaccine passport being pushed so hard. It's like, they're trying to have this happen on a global scale. They want everyone digitized every, you know, they want to keep tabs on everyone. Uh, it's just very scary. And I don't know, I don't want it to happen. And some, some yeah. days I feel like we're doing great. We're putting up a good fight. And then other days I'm like, uh, we're the little guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what gives me hope is that as erratic and as heavy handed as these like these tyrants on the, the globalists and the people on the national level and all that, as as heavy handed as they're being, they're not behaving like people who who um, really feel secure in their position on things. They're behaving you know, like people seeing, who are you're seeing like tells of insecurity. I, I think that's what we've been seeing for the last half decade, ever since Donald Trump got elected. These are people who are like who are terrified that they're losing control over this, this, uh, the, these, these governmental institutions. And I think that's why, you know, they've had to operate so heavy hand in such a heavy handed fashion. So out in the open in a way that, um, that, they, they, you know, they never would have done before. Uh, I mean, you have, I mean, the fact that they, they went in front of the public, they, they lied to the American public for years about calling the president like a Russian spy Mm -hmm. uh, you had a uh, huge abuses of power by uh, these these federal spy agencies out in the open for everyone to see. 
They don't like doing those things out in the open. They want to stay in the background and do these things behind the scenes in a clandestine fashion where nobody can hold them, like can see that, that they're up to no good, but they had to operate out in the open. People, uh, people see what kind of government we're, un we're under more and more. And once you see that, it's kind of hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Yeah, I was talking to, um, well, she's no longer the redheaded libertarian, but she's Queen Josie now. And she was saying that this is all like, it really became ramped up when Trump won because he wasn't supposed to win. The powers right. that be were, thought they had it, they had made it so, so that he would they never have won in the first place. Got very cocky. He won. That everyone freaked out, and that maybe now they're in catch up mode or they're just being extra because the plans that they would have had going had Hillary won are now, you know, four years backed up. Yeah, yeah, and. and I mean, this is the thing. I, I, I think that so many of them think that, oh, the problem was Donald Trump, right? Uh, it's just Donald Trump somehow cast a spell on all these people. And now that we got rid of Donald Trump, things are going to go back to normal. We're going to have kind of the old neoconservative, neoliberal order where that's the two choices you get. You get to vote for Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush. That's what we're going back to, right? Except we're not going back to that. Mm. Uh, pe people have seen that that's kind of an illusion of choice. It's, it, and I mean, geez, I mean, especially kind of in the Republican party, I mean, people, people are not people, <laughs> neoconservatism of the kind that we saw under George W. Bush and with the Cheney's of the world has been so thoroughly repudiated in the Republican party. I didn't think, you know, being a, a child of the Bush era, I didn't think it was possible that that things could have shifted so far so quickly to see Liz Cheney getting drummed out of office. She's one of the most hated people in the Republican Party. You have these uh, neoconservatives who basically help lie America into war, resigning from Fox News, saying, we thought it was going to go back to the way it was when Trump was gone. And now we're sad that Tucker Carlson is is still there and, and still do. I guess things aren't going back to normal. No, they're not. Trump was just a symptom of what is a larger phenomenon that's taking place in this country, which is that people are sick and tired of the forever wars, the the just the unaccountable government, the erosion of our constitutional liberties. And people don't necessarily have always the best strategy for how to kind of turn that around. But people are angry and people are not accepting the bullshit of of these old the, the old establishment. I, I don't see it going back to normal. And good. It shouldn't. It's it, it makes me happy to hear that. And I'm, I'm thinking about like the media because I only until Trump said fake news, fake news. It just I woke up one day and I was like, oh, my God, yeah, they're lying. It's all propaganda. And now I'm thinking, how long has it been like this? Has it always been this way or did they really ramp it up during Trump, which then woke myself and many others oh, yeah. up just during his time? You know, Glenn Greenwald had a tweet today. Uh, there was this report about. Uh, you know, White House officials are meeting with, uh, uh, you know, uh, officials from some of the big media corporations to talk about how we can frame coverage of the economy in a different in a different way, because, you know, uh, the Biden administration doesn't feel like uh, they're coming across very well. And, you know, um, Greenwald just points out, well, that really seems a lot like state run media. If if uh, if in the if in the yeah. back, if in the back channels like the government officials are talking with the media officials about how the government should be covered, yeah. Do you remember where? Let's see. Do I have to scroll down? I want to get to this tweet of his. Um. All right, maybe I won't find it. But yeah. That's that's great that he's basically pointing out like, uh, isn't this propaganda? Yeah, he's been great on that. I mean, talking about one of the few people on kind of a national level who's been doing what he's been doing through multiple administrations and he's been absolutely consistent. I mean, I remember when I was, you know, I, I it pains me to admit when I was younger just how much I believed the, the you know, the neoconservative pro-war propaganda back in the day. Um, but I, you know, I remember Glenn Greenwald calling out the Bush administration for the Patriot Act, the wars, and then and all my leftist friends being right there with them. And then eventually I realized my leftist friends were right. These wars were bad. The Patriot Act was bad. Uh, but then under the Obama administration, something changed. And all of a sudden, all my leftist friends suddenly were for those things because Obama was for them. And I thought I had like finally been like, all right, we got something we can work together on. But Glenn Greenwald has been absolutely consistent through through the Bush administration 
the Obama administration, Trump and Biden. And it's just like everyone else is just playing tribal politics, you know, my team versus their team. And uh, Glenn Greenwald seems pretty committed that his team is the team of civil liberties and the Constitution, no matter which party is against it. And he's a great Twitter follow, too. And I think that's hard. It's, I think it's easier to be just for one team. It's like kind of safer that way. And like a lot of people it is. didn't know what to make of Ann Coulter when she was suddenly uh, she was, you know, very much for Trump in the beginning, you know, guessed that he was going to win before anybody else was thinking was even taking him seriously. And then she kind of turned her back on him and it's like, oh, well, he didn't deliver on the promises that he made to his base, you know, while he was running. And and I think people don't know what to think of you. They're like, oh, I already hated you because, you know, well, so many people right. hate Ann Coulter, but I hated you specifically because you were for Trump. And now I don't know what to make of you. But you know what? People are easily confused. Uh, yeah. From Crash Mondo, we are going to win, Chrissy. We are going to win. Okay, good. Good. I, I feel better now. <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna win, but I'm glad. <laughs> I hope we I hope we keep winning so much that we get tired of winning. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is a good comment from Joe Flink. It seems that Trump blindsided the establishment, but their massive resource base knew they had four years to figure out a stealth strategy to nullify his efforts and they pooled their efforts well. Yeah, it seems just from interviewing Sebastian Gorka, it just seems like he had a lot of bad people around him or you know, there was a lot of plotting from the inside to kind of undermine his efforts. Yeah. yeah, I I um, I oftentimes wonder what it would have been like if we had gone with Rand Paul instead of Donald Trump. And I think oh, Donald wow. Trump, <laughs> I mean, I, uh, that's a whole different scenario. But but th that is one of the problems that uh, of Donald Trump is that he had some I think he had some pretty good instincts on a lot of things. Um, but he didn't always have a very coherent worldview and a very coherent, you know, uh, how to, what the policies actually should be. And he surrounded himself with a whole bunch of snakes. I mean, he surrounded himself with John Bolton, uh, who stabbed him in the back when he was trying to negotiate with North Korea, who stabbed him in the back when he was trying to keep us out of war with Iran. He surrounded himself with so many snakes and personnel was policy. He really set himself up to fail in that way. Um, but, you know, I look at if we're pinning our hopes and dreams on the idea that we're going to fix things in Washington, D.C., that we're going to elect the right people, we're going to get our savior into the White House, whoever that is, we're going to get great, you know, awesome people who love liberty to be a majority in the U.S. Congress. We're going to be waiting a long time. I think that's a, um, you know, I'm glad to have a few good people there. I think people like Rand Paul and Thomas Massey, who are my two favorites in Washington. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I think that Washington is a bit of a sideshow and a distraction. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot. I mean, look at what they do in Congress most of the time these days. I mean, they spend more time naming post offices than they actually do debating on and voting on, you know, matters of war. And we're at war in, in who, who can even, you know, name all the countries we're at war and we don't talk about it anymore. We're in Somalia. Yeah. Nobody talks about that. Yemen. Nobody talks about that. Syria. That was never declared yet. We're there. It, but, I only hear libertarians talking about these wars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody. I mean, what ha What happened is after the vote to authorize military force in Iraq, politicians lost their jobs over that because the people didn't like it, and they said, "We don't want to go on record voting for these wars anymore." But geez, you know, the military-industrial complex donates a lot to our campaigns, so we're just going to let the wars happen, and we're just not going to vote on it, and we're just not going to point it out, and we're just going to, you know. We're just going to let that happen. So that's where we are. But where I have what what gives me hope is I think that there is unfolding in the country right now what I call state legislative strategy. I think that the states are really the sleeping giants of this whole American experiment. We do not often appreciate just how much power rests in the states and uh, states, you know, you get good people elected to your state legislature, which is much easier to win than a seat in Congress. Uh, and you can accomplish real things there. You can fight back against state tyranny, you know, which we've needed these days fighting against all these lockdowns coming from governors and all that. But you can also fight back against federal tyranny and people don't often appreciate just how much can be done. You know, basically, you know, we call it nullification. We nullified federal cannabis laws state by state across the country. The federal government never had any constitutional authority to outlaw what you could, you know, what kind of plants mm -hmm. you could smoke. 
They never had that, right? They did it anyway. But people on the state level came along. They said, we're sick and tired of waiting for Congress to stop doing this and to decide that they made a mistake. And so we're just going to nullify and say, you know what, you know what, federal government, your law, we don't recognize it in our state. Started in California and then Maine and spread across the country. You know, this has happened with right to try laws. This is, you know, basically uh, states telling the FDA to mind its own damn business. And if terminally ill patients want to try an experimental medication to save their own lives, they shouldn't have to ask the federal government for permission to do that. I mean, these are all acts that state legislatures have done to say, you know, we don't recognize your authority here. People are doing this on gun rights. People mm -hmm. are doing this. Uh, and I mean, even on foreign policy, you have across the country over this past year in something like over 30 states, legislators put forward something called defend the guard legislation, which would cite state authority over state national guards to call the troops home from these wars in Afghanistan. Uh, well, it, well, I guess we're out of Afghanistan now, but, but Syria and these other places, um, you know, it says if Congress doesn't declare the war, they don't have the constitutional authority to take our national guard troops and send them over to fight these wars. So if Congress isn't willing to sign their name to it, then you don't get our national guard troops. And so there's a lot that can be done on the state level. If you get actual people with a backbone and with balls, willing to stand up to Washington. We're lacking balls, except for you, Eric. You have balls. Um, <laughs> oh, I appreciate comment, it. <laughs> comment here from Crash Mondo. Um, he was saying, this was a conversation going on in the chat. Uh, I guess it's regarding Biden. He actually did order a pullout of Syria. The DOD ignored that order. Yemen is definitely on his hands, though. I think he's probably talking about Trump. Okay. Um, uh, though right. I know why didn't, why didn't he pull out of Syria and Yemen and then, okay, he was answering. Yeah. Um, I know. Now I don't think Trump ever ordered a full withdrawal out of Syria. He moved troops around a little bit. I wish he, you know, I look Trump, Trump is the only president in my lifetime who didn't start any new wars. And that's a big credit to him, especially when he was being pushed, especially he was being pushed to start a war with Iran. We walked up to the, the, the line and Trump decided, you know, this is a really bad idea. And thankfully, he was listening to Tucker Carlson and Rand Paul on that one and not John Bolton. Um, so he deserves a lot of credit for not starting any new wars. I wish he had done more to get us out of the, the existing ones. But yeah, he, he was dealing with a lot of entrenched bureaucracy. And I mean, we saw this. I mean, this is what the whole Russiagate hoax was for four years. This was an effort to box him in so that he couldn't take the actions that he had promised to the American people he would do during his campaign. They boxed him in, they, 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 um, and they kept him having to fight off this whole, you know, Russian conspiracy theory. Uh, and it's exhausting. Yeah. It was relentless. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this wasn't necessarily just coming from, uh, uh, you know, elected officials. We expect this from the Democrats to do this to a Republican president. This was coming from the unelected bureaucracy. This was coming from the military industrial complex. This was coming from the FBI and the CIA and, 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 you know, the deep state, these, these unelected bureaucracies that we, the people don't get to vote on. They're insulated from any accountability from us. They're supposed to answer to our elected officials, but they seem to think that they're above our elected officials and that our elected officials are supposed to answer to them. And that's the perilous situation we find ourselves in. How how do we how do we rein in these unaccountable, unelected careerists in Washington D.C. who have their own policy agendas that they don't think the people should have any say in? More term limits. It sounds obvious, but yeah, I mean, you look at like how, long how do you get? Pelosi I wish we get been, been yeah. working there. It's like yeah, they feel like they're invisible or that they don't have to answer to anybody. Yeah. Well, e even beyond Pelosi, it's like, how do you put term limits on like the head of the FBI? You know? Yeah. <laughs> what is he gonna do? Or, work at Starbucks? Or, yeah. Or term limits on like the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank? Like th these are things we don't get to vote on these things, and yet these these folks wield tremendous power over over our everyday lives. Yeah, you were talking about Congress kind of being a distraction or not. And I feel like another thing that I only hear libertarians talking about is how just deeply in debt slash bankrupt uh, the U.S. government is. Why do you think that is? Oh, well, he just hit $29 trillion, right? <laughs> that's the that's the new national debt. And that's only the tip of the iceberg, really. If you count the unfunded liabilities to so all the promises we've made that we don't have any idea how we're going to pay for it, you include like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, you're looking at you're looking at uh, 
you know, like another 150 trillion on top of that. So yeah, we're look, Washington, Washington DC gets money th one of three ways from us. They steal it from our, our, our paychecks with taxes. They steal it from our, our futures with debt, or they steal it from our savings and retirements with inflation. They've been running the printing presses so long to just kind of monetize their, um, to just paper over the, the deficits that they've been running in Washington, DC. And it's, um, yeah, the system is going insolvent. I mean, I think that anyone with, you know, a little bit of economic sense can see like, this can't last forever, even if the folks in Washington, DC are acting like it can. I mean, they're talking about raising the debt ceiling again. They're talking about expanding, you know, Bernie, the Bernie Sanders budget bill. They call it the build, build back better bill. They call it. It's really Bernie Sanders budget. Bring back better. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the Bernie budget bill. So they're expanding Medicare. They're lowering the age of eligibility. But you got the Medicare trustees who are pointing out like this program is going to be insolvent within like a decade. Oh, like no. what are they doing about that? They're, they're going to make it go insolvent faster. They're, they're, like they're not dealing fluff. with reality. Like fluff. Yeah. Yeah. So this it's a house of cards. It's, it's going to fall apart. And I just hope uh, I think they're going to destroy the currency in the process uh, with just how much money they're printing. And I just, I just hope that people do what they can to protect themselves and don't, don't, don't keep your savings in dollars. That, that much is certain. So it sounds like you're saying buy as much crypto as you can. I mean, are there options outside of crypto? Well, I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not going to tell people what they should do, but I can tell you what I'm doing and I'm yeah, buying a lot I was of Bitcoin. Your good friend and I was asking you, <laughs> I, I'm buying a lot of Bitcoin. That's what I'm doing. And okay. that's been my strategy for the last like half a decade. So it's worked out pretty well for me. Yeah. Bitcoin back better. Yeah. Okay. That's the BBB we need. <laughs> yeah. This is a good comment from Wonder Bucket. Ironic that they would be opposed to terminally ill people taking experimental medicine. Meanwhile, they insist healthy people take an experimental vaccine. You guys yeah. are so smart in the chat. I don't deserve you. <laughs> They just, you know, it's about control. It's about mm -hmm. control for them. They, they don't want you making decisions for your life that they don't approve of, even though it's your life and they've got no right to tell you how to live your life as long as you're not hurting anyone. Do you think this is true, Eric? Um, this is from Eternal Doorman. You can't put term, li term limits on posts like the head of the FBI because not even the president of the United States knows who that actually is. Well, okay. Um how do I interpret that? I mean, I we, we know who the director of the FBI is. I guess I, is he suggesting that there's like the director of the FBI is just a just just a appointed figurehead, and there's a you know the, the real power behind the throne is someone we don't I don't know maybe I I don't know, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. that's a lot of yeah. There's you could go down that rabbit hole for sure. Yeah, tell me about your show, Free America Now. Yeah, so this is something I launched. Uh, it's been just, we just released our, I think our 63rd or 64th episode. I do this, I uh, just had Maj Toure, the founder of Black Guns <gasps> Matter on today. Maj. Yeah, I love Maj. Mm -hmm. He's awesome. Uh, but uh, but I'm ha basically having conversations with folks across the liberty movement. We're talking state legislators, activists, and just, you know, thinkers out there across the liberty movement. People are doing, be, doing good things on a daily basis to try to free America now. And uh, it's been a great run so far. Our audience is growing. I welcome anyone who uh, wants to check it out. You can, we're on all major podcasting apps, and um, we release an episode Monday through Friday. It's It's been uh, – I'm kind of new to the podcasting game. You've been doing this for a while. I mean, I've been a guest on podcasts, but having my own podcast is kind of new. So it's been a, quite, quite an awesome experiment. Really, it's been a great excuse to talk to people who, um, like, you know, it's – I that couldn't you would get never this person bump into normally. Yeah, right. It's like I wouldn't be able to just call, uh, you know, reach out to this person and say, "Hey, could I just have a like? Uh, could I just call you and have an hour long conversation with you and pick your brain on things?" Like they probably wouldn't give me the time of day. But when I say, "Well, I've got a podcast that's listened to by, by listened to by thousands of people, and I'd love to talk with you about X topic," then people are much more eager to have that mm -hmm. conversation. So it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Who would be your like? Who are your dream guests? <sighs> Oh, I'd love to get Edward Snowden on. That would be like my dream. I wonder if he's busy. 
Yeah, I, <laughs> I, he's like he's like a dad now over in Russia. He's doing like good for him. Uh, he actually he spoke at our national convention, of Young Americans for Liberty, earlier this year. That was pretty awesome. Of course, he wasn't there in person. If he came in person, the feds would snatch him up. So he had to zoom in. But um, but I've interacted with him a little bit on Twitter. He's uh, he's a pretty uh, he's pretty down to earth guy, and I think someone who's done, you know, I think if if anyone deserves to have their face on a postage stamp, it's Edward Snowden. <laughs> Yeah, I would take that over a forever stamp. Yeah. Do you, and right, Snowden, that was another promise that Trump, I think, or people expected him to pardon Snowden. Yeah, I, I actually heard from a good source that there were pardons for Snowden, Assange, and Ross Ulbricht that were on Trump's desk that never got signed in the last day with all the chaos that went on. And uh. I, I, and I, I and I look. And this is this is from a source. I, this is secondhand information. I'm, it could, it it might not be true, but I heard it from a pretty good source. And um, with all the chaos that went on that last day, and I'm sure Trump was getting threatened, and he was under a lot of pressure. And um, I I was disappointed in him for not doing that. But I can also understand to some degree, um, you know, you got a whole you know, criminal organization we call the U S government that is, uh, you know, threatening to go after him the moment he leaves office. And, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine being in his shoes in that situation. So, I mean, I would hope that if I were in his shoes, I would have signed those pardons, but I, I imagine there was a lot of pressure there. <sighs> yeah, I agree. Um, tell me about the young Americans for Liberty group. Yeah. So I'm so uh, honored to, uh, so I'm the senior spokesperson for Young Americans for Liberty. We're an organization we started in 2008 as students for Ron Paul, uh, all the young kind of youth activism that came out of the, the Ron Paul campaigns. We became Young Americans for Liberty for the longest time. We were exclusively focused on campus activism on college campuses. And we have some of the best campus programs fighting for free speech and overturning a lot of the kind of crazy stuff from college administrators and the woke mobs at the same time. Um, but in recent years, we have expanded. We're not just doing campus stuff. We're also taking our activists, mobilizing them, identifying principled Ron Paul style candidates for state legislative office across the country. And we're knocking doors to get them elected. When I was in the state Senate back in Maine, there were maybe like, if you looked across the country in state legislatures, there were maybe about if you were being generous, you could say maybe 10 like principled libertarian Ron Paul style legislators in the state capitals today, because of the work that Young Americans for Liberty has done, we're close to 200 across 37 states. And these are folks who are passing school choice, passing constitutional carry, you know, nullifying the, 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 you know, the mask mandates and the vaccine mandates from the federal government, fighting back against lockdowns and all the rest. These are, these are the kind of folks that we need to get elected, principled champions of liberty who will go in and hold the government accountable. So uh, I'm really blessed to be able to take my experience from my time in the state Senate uh, and help <laughs> mentor some of these newbie legislators and, um, and spread the message on the good work that, that our activists are doing and our legislators are doing. That's really great it, to have a focused place where you know you, you can find, okay, uh, these, these guys or girls are, are going to be supporting the things that, you know, that I'm into, that I want my values. Cause it can seem kind of just like daunting. Like every time there's an election, you're like, ah, ah like what, a, <laughs> what is everybody doing? What is everyone yeah. for? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy that you're still, I can't get over. You're so young. You're 33. You're like, I'm the senior <laughs> spokesperson. I'm like, you're, it's, you're such well, a wee babe, but you have well, a lot of experience. Well, here at Young Americans for Liberty, I feel like the old guy here. Everyone here is like <laughs> you know, a bunch of a bunch of twenty somethings running around. I remember being that, having that much energy, and now I feel like the old guy. They're all running circles around me. So that gives me a lot of hope and optimism for for uh, you know for the future. That there are so many uh, young Americans who are fighting every day on college campuses and at the ballot box and in the state legislatures to get our freedoms back. Yeah. Now we're sneezing and throwing out our backs. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. My hairline's receding, so no. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to be an old American for liberty before too long. <laughs> no. At least a middle-aged American for liberty. You know, at least you're not going around, uh, you know, calling yourselves the Young Turks while being like, you know, fifty and sweaty. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a statute of limitations on that. I feel like once you're old enough to run for president, you can't call yourself young anymore. Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, agreed. What does Jeffersonian mean? Yeah, I just put that there. I'm a big fan of Thomas Jefferson. I think he gets a real bad rap these days. You know, they just took down one of his statues in the New York City. <gasps> oh that it's, my god! Yeah. Really? How did I not hear about this? I heard they took down the um the other one, the the one that was no oh, the, the Robert Robert E. Lee. Yeah, yeah, they took that. So. It's crazy. They were talking about taking that statue down, the Robert E. Lee statue, and putting it in a museum. And look, I get it. I mean, people don't want these. People don't want these. You know, there, there's, there's a lot. You know, I, I get that. If you want to put it in a museum and have some historical context around it, I get that. If you don't think that these statues represent what what your community is about today, fine. But now they're talking about taking the Robert E. Lee statue, melting it down, mm -hmm. and turning it into like some new symbol of like racial justice and harmony what you know social justice ism whatever whatever you know whatever that's supposed to mean for them i mean that just i don't know i just it reminds me of that like scene in man in the high castle when they took the liberty bell and they melted it down it, it it just uh, you know i put it sure put it in a museum uh but but the thomas jefferson statue this is what really bothers me is it, th there's such a false narrative about Thomas Jefferson that is being put out there. You know, they say that, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a slave, slave owner. We need to take that. So we can't honor him. We, we need banged to take a lot of slaves. Big deal. Yeah. He was a great well, guy. <laughs> well, here's, here's the thing. It was like Thomas Jefferson throughout his entire public life fought to abolish slavery. Like he was one of the biggest abolitionists in Virginia. He got elected to his state legislature at the age of 26. Not making any comparisons wow, there. Wow, just like but you. At the age of 26, one of the first things he did, like uh, he he sponsored legislation in Virginia to gradually abolish slavery in the state. The whole Virginia legislature turned against him and gave him a piece of his mind, called his senior co-sponsor on that, a traitor to the country. But like he persisted. You read his early drafts of the Declaration of Independence, condemning slavery, condemning King George for imposing this on the colonies, uh, you know, stopping efforts that they put in place to try to, to, end, to end the practice. Uh, it, through the rest of his political career, you know, he... He, he authored the Northwest Ordinance, outlined slavery in many of the new states admitted into the Union, almost almost got it passed so that all new states admitted in the Union, all the even the, the Western states would have been would have been prohibited this. But as and as president, he signed the uh, he, he, he pushed for and signed legislation banning the importation of, 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 of slaves into America. There's really if you look at his record, his public record, what he did his kind of crusade against slavery during his time of office, it's very hard to find anyone of his generation who did more. And so he gets a bad rap. I get it. You know, all historical figures are complex. He was born into a wealthy family in Virginia. It was illegal to, um, it was illegal to, uh, you know, free your slaves. There were, there, there were a lot of dynamics going on there, but he was one of these figures in a generation that was born with slavery being a, a, a an institution just wrapped into society, and they were part of this generation who said, "This has got to change. This th this cannot continue." And he perhaps, you know, these major institutions maybe we we can't change them as quickly as we'd like to. Uh, he he didn't have the power. His contemporary abolitionists like Ben Franklin and others didn't have the power to to abolish these institutions overnight. But they set it on the course where it was doomed to fail. And, and, um, yeah, I, so anyway, the attacks on Thomas Jefferson, I think are, are misguided. And oftentimes I think that what they, um, s that some attacking him really just don't like the big vision of liberty, uh, of individual liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that he set for our country's mission statement. And they'd like to have a, a kind of a, a cultural revolution like we saw in, in uh, in China, in the lead up to you know during during Mao's day in China, you gotta you gotta tear down the the yep. old the history. You gotta tear down the the figures and the ideals that we look up to, and you gotta replace it with something new. And I think that that's what some are attempting to do in our country. Yeah, just any of the founding fathers, anybody who is a, is a was a white guy uh, is bad and needs to be torn down. It's a, yeah, I agree with you completely. So that's something else. Icky can be ushered in, but we're not going to let that happen, yeah. Eric. Nope. We're going to free America now. <laughs> right now. Not later. Not tomorrow. Oh, I forgot to bring this up while we were talking about 
weed. Uh, shout out to our sponsor, Cushy Dreams. I think I'm a big fan of their stuff. It's very high quality bud and pre-rolls CBD. So it's you can get all the health benefits without getting high. Uh, there's different indica sativa blends like Relax, Dream, Create, Hustle, Energy. So whatever you want, Cushy Dreams has your back. They do tons of independent um, testing to ensure quality and compliance. You can see that in their lab results on their website, cushydreams.com, K-U-S-H-Y dreams.com. Join the men and women who are sick of vapes and gummies and want to smoke their CBD at the checkout. Use promo code CMP to get 20% off plus free shipping. I think it ships to all 50 states, if I'm not mistaken. Good stuff, guys. Uh, they've helped me a lot with my anxiety. And... Uh, it's not weed because if I smoke weed, I'm gonna I'm gonna eat a lot of cheese doodles. And that's not what I'm about. I'm trying to get svelte in 2022. Right, Eric? Go for it. <laughs> I thought you were frozen. I was like, he's either frozen or he doesn't find me funny. <laughs> this is great. Are right, any plans to run for office again in the future? Uh, I'm thinking about going back and running for my old state senate seat, but. Um... I ran for federal office twice. I'm kind of done with that for now. That really burned me out. But uh, but I got a lot done during my time in the state Senate in Maine. I'm, I'm, I'm considering going back for the seat that I held before. When would that be? Would that be? That'd be next year. 20. Oh, okay. Wow. That's coming up. When do you have to decide? If I'm going to do it, I got to start getting signatures, uh, you know, in January. So I got I to gotta pull the trigger soon. I'm Don't you do need this. as a libertarian like a ridiculous amount of signatures, or is that why you run Republican? Well, so um it, it would actually be the same. It would be the same if I was running as an LP candidate versus a GOP candidate. But the challenge is you need to get signatures from people in your party to get on the ballot. And are there enough registered libertarians in your district to to get those signatures? It, it's a lot easier when like a third of all the people in the district are registered Republicans. I can get 100 Republican signatures easy. Getting 100 Libertarian Party members' signatures, they're few and far between. So, yeah, no. I, I, and I'm, I would be running as a Republican. That's the best vehicle I found for getting elected and making change. Yeah, you'd have to go to like Pork Fest or something or some convention. Yeah. You know, Libertarian yeah. around. Oh, oh, yeah. But they wouldn't all be in my district. But uh, I love going. I love going to Pork Fest. Great people there. I almost went this past year. I, I was going to oh. be a speaker on a, like a fee, some sort of a female panel. But I think I had a stand up gig. But I think I'm going to go next year. Well, all right. You should get there. Well, I'll, I, I'll probably be there next year as well. So I'll have to, Ooh. you know, welcome okay, I'll, you. I'll see you at the campfire. That's what I'm imagining. That it's like there's a lot of campfires. <laughs> it's like, like a whole it's like a whole pop up like community for an entire week. It's so like it's, foam parties and things of that nature, like a slip and slide with body oil. You know, I haven't seen that, but, you know, it is it's it's <laughs> it is like, you know, anarchy. So, you know, if that's what you, if that's what you want to bring to the table, I'm sure you can set that up on your campsite. <laughs> People will jump in. That sounds fun. That sounds fun, Eric. Uh, where can people find you and follow you and listen to your podcast? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter. My uh, handle is Senator Brakey. Uh, that's uh, B-R-A-K-E-Y, like achy, breaky heart. And uh, you can follow, uh, you can also learn more about Young Americans for Liberty at yaliberty.org. And you can listen to the Free America Now podcast. We are on all major podcasting apps uh, pretty much any podcasting app out there, you'll you'll find us. So be sure to subscribe. I'd love to have anyone in your audience. I'd love to have them listen in and uh, really appreciate the chance to talk with you today. No, you were great. The chat loved you and they're pretty. Uh, well, I, I love them. <laughs> oh, thank you guys for your super chats and your great comments as always. Guys, again, reminder, I'm taping my album, my first comedy special, January 6th at Governor's in Levittown. Get your tickets for that. I want to see your smiling faces. Eric, thanks again for coming on. This was really great. Can't wait to have you back. You're just a wealth of information. No, oh, pleasure's all mine. Happy to come back anytime. Yay. All right, guys. Peace out. Bye.